Welcome to episode 147 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing David Patterson. He's a writer and producer. Many of his films have been adaptations of novels, or in the case of his very first feature film, it was an adaptation of one of his plays. So we talk about the process of adaptation in the interview, among many other things. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they are very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 147. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional logline and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So a quick few words about what I'm working on. So once again, the main thing I'm trying to push through is post-production on my crime action thriller film, The Pinch. I have an appointment with my editor this Friday and he says he's going to have a complete rough cut. So I'm excited to see that. Once that done, there's going to be quite a bit of work on my end, watching the film and giving the editor notes and just tweaking and, and iterating on that. So I've probably got a few weeks worth of work once we get the rough cut. Um, just getting the thing polished up and then locking picture. On the writing front, I'm still working away on my limited location romantic comedy. There's not really any deadline on that, so I think I've been kind of procrastinating and lagging a little bit. I really need to dig into that this week and try and get some of that polished up as once the rough cut for the pinch is done, I will be tied to that for, as I said, probably quite a while. So I want to really um, work hard before my meeting on Friday on this um, on this romantic comedy, work hard on that till Friday, and then I'll be off on the pinch probably, as I said for the next few weeks. Anyway, that's what I'm currently working on. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing screenwriter and producer David Patterson. Here is the interview. Welcome, David, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Uh, it's my pleasure. So to start out, maybe you can just give us a little background about yourself and kind of how you got into the entertainment industry. Okay, uh, I'm gonna have to take you back a couple years. Um, That's fine. <laughs> uh, I started out acting in my in my early teens, um, doing uh, theater, um, community theater uh, uh, with colleges, but playing the younger role. Uh, and um, I actually didn't do high school theater because I did a lot of sports. But um, you know, just as a young kid starting doing theater with grownups, you actually start to realize. Early on, you got to sort of be grown up yourself, especially when you're, you know, uh, handling your own career. Um, when I decided to choose a college to go to, I chose a college um, that was in a major city where I could pursue acting even on the side because I was already starting to act professionally um, as at a younger age. So I went to D.C. and I was able to get two of my uh, three union cards through that, both uh, SAG and AFTRA. And of course, back then, SAG and AFTRA were separated. Now they're they're one group. Um, and writing wasn't initially on my, on my radar. Um, I went, I wanted to become a stuntman. So I went to uh, London to study, to become a stuntman because there really weren't any stunt programs in the United States. And, uh, while I was in London, I actually took a playwriting course while I was there and, um, then started writing, uh, my mother, and we'll probably touch on this later, was a writer, um, is, is still a writer. Uh, but uh, the writing thing, I hadn't thought about doing it. And then when I came back to the States, I went back to acting and stunt work and did a little writing on the side. Um, but uh, when my wife and I decided to have kids, I said, I'll stop the acting and uh, stunt work. I had a small role on One Life to Live. And uh, I said, I'll raise the kids. And that's when I really started concentrating on my writing, uh, when I wasn't tearing my hair out or napping with the kids because they're a lot of work. 
But I really... I have two young kids myself, so I'm right there with you. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Don't think uh, if, if you're about to have a child to, to tell your husband or wife or partner, I'll oh, stay home because it's a breeze, uh, because it certainly is not. I'm sitting down, but uh, I tell people I used to be 6'10", and I'm currently 5'9", and that's from staying home with two boys for uh, uh -huh. now 20 years. Uh, right. But that's when I really started concentrating on my writing, and... Um, I was a, a well. I became a playwright. I had a show on Broadway, a couple off Broadway. Um, hadn't really thought about the film business overall, although I had optioned a book um, many, many years ago, which we'll, we'll cover as well. Um, uh, and a novel you had written, you wrote a novel, and you you no 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 a novel that I had optioned. Oh, I see. I'm okay, still okay. terrified of novels. That's a lot of words. Uh, no kidding. <laughs> I tell people screenwriting is kind of the cheater version of writing because, uh, you know, it's 100, 110 pages. You write a novel, that's like, I don't know, 200 pages of single space, and it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do that. But then, uh, so I'd written a couple screenplays, but nothing really happened. And then 9-11 happened. Uh, I'm in New York City. Um, I was a rescue worker um, the first couple of days after the attacks, and obviously that affected a lot of people. Um, I'd like to say there's always some type of positive that comes out of a negative. And one thing that came to me was here I was waiting for someone to discover me as a writer because uh, I thought I was brilliant. All writers do think they're brilliant. Uh, but then I realized you could be here one day and gone the next. And so um, I told my wife we were going to put a little money together and I was going to take one of my plays and shoot it as this little indie film. And I had heard about this film festival called Sundance. I wasn't really familiar with it because uh, I wasn't in, in, in the film business. But I said, yeah, we'll submit it. It's a pretty good film. It'll get in. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, I only found out later that uh, that's not how it happens. But uh, that was 05, 2005. It was my first film. And I really haven't gone back to plays. And I really haven't gone back to anything else. Um, I'm releasing my um, third feature in October. Um, but I've also produced um, documentaries, and I've also produced half a dozen shorts, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I'm in the movie business, like it or not. Um, and so, one question I just one question I want to just um, and we'll definitely talk a little bit um, since the your current movie, The Great Gilly Hopkins, is is based on a book written by your mother. We'll dig in a little bit more to that. One of the things that I found difficult in pursuing writing, I grew up in Annapolis, Maryland. I literally didn't know any writers, didn't certainly didn't know any filmmakers, and I always felt like that was a big thing to overcome, just because you don't have any role models. It doesn't even feel like a reality. And I'm curious how you know you. I mean, your mom has written dozens of books. She must have been in her room just writing almost every day um and so that must have just been an influence where you at least felt like it was possible but then you're telling me you started out as acting and stuff did it feel like you didn't want to compete with your mom was there something keeping you away from writing because she had been so successful at it um yeah what was that dynamic like actually you actually kind of hit it on the head um my mother uh is actually a fairly successful novelist um my first major successful film of course, all my films are – once you actually make a film and people see it, it's a success, regardless of uh, finances or stuff. But um, going back, I had optioned a book many, many years earlier, and it was called The Bridge to Terabithia. And my mother wrote that book. And um, I actually – the book is based on me, and I'm not going to ruin the book, um, but the book became very successful. Um, and we went from actually being poor white trash – to fairly decent middle class from the success of that book. Hmm. But the book was based on me, and I was ashamed of it. I was ashamed of it because of how our wealth changed because of this tragedy that happened uh, within the book. And so I steered clear of that book, and I think in a way steered clear of writing as well because I didn't want to be compared to my mom, you know, and certainly not trying to write a novel, as we said. It's a lot of thing. And I always felt that someone would say, well, who does he think he is? He's certainly not his mom, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm not. And uh, so, I mean, I still actually have fantasies of writing a novel someday. But um, for now, I like writing scripts. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you've just discussed it, and I'm sure everyone discussed it, not writing one script or two scripts or four scripts or six scripts. You really got to keep writing. Um, it is an exercise that only gets better uh, the more you do it. And you shouldn't be sitting on, on one project just knowing that that's, that's the way to go about it. So, yeah, um, 
I guess I shied away from writing because I didn't want comparisons. And um, then I was able to, years later, turn Bridge Terabithia into a very successful Disney film. And I realized, A, there's nothing really to be ashamed about that. Uh, but B, if you actually do a good job, it's something to be very, very proud of. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's a, it's a tough thing to adapt another work, uh, whether it's a short story, a book, or even a news, news account to to film it's uh sure, sure so let's talk about your first film um that went to sundance this play that you adapted um how many plays had you written up to that point and of all these plays you had written why did you decide on that one to be the the one that you filmed versus any of your other plays it's a great question well at that point i think i had written close to uh 15 16 plays actually maybe closer to 20 um and uh, by 2000, I had 15 of those had been published by Samuel French, which is a play publishing company. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had a, a, a large selection to choose from, but I also am a cheap son of a bitch, and I know that anything costs money. So I went and looked back at the plays that I had. I said, what can I make for not a lot of money? And this play that I chose, um, the title was called Finger Painting in a Murphy Bed. Um, we had to change the title because... A lot of people today don't know what a Murphy bed is. Um, so it's a wall bed, by the way, that you okay. pull down. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Well, see, there you go. There you go. So we knew the title would have to change because no one knows what a Murphy bed is. But the reason I chose that, it was a three-person play. And I said, okay, so all I need is three actors. And, of course, no, you don't because it's not my dinner with Andre. Um, so what I did from there, I was able to build the screenplay out from taking the, it all took place uh, in uh, 24 hours in an apartment. And I said, I want to expand upon that because I think the audience would get very claustrophobic if, it, if it's just that scene. Now, of course, all the demand is one room scenes. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of people are saying, oh, we want a movie that we can shoot in one location and, and, and that's it. Um, but when I was doing it, I, I, I felt that I needed to expand upon it. So, um, Two of the characters worked at an office, and in the play, you don't see the office, so I was able to incorporate an office. And then uh, some of their dialogue that took place uh, in the apartment, I I was able to put on their date. Their date, they had just talked about a date, but you never saw the date. And so I expanded from that, but also keeping in mind uh, finances, and you've talked about this on your pod, I, I, I decided where I could write the scenes, where I could get the locations for free. Mm-hmm. And that's really important when you're on low, low budget, right with the idea that you are the poorest person on the planet. And so if you're doing this, you need to know you can secure locations and actors and props and everything for little to, to no money. And the great thing about uh, Love Ludlow, which was the final title, is um, we... The movie cost $75,000, and this was back in 05, where we were still using film. We were shooting on film, so that's actually pretty expensive. But we looked at our budget and our books at the end, and we got close to $200,000, $250,000 of free things uh, from people if you actually put a dollar amount to it. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's a very important thing. And also, making a film is art by collaboration, so you should be working with your collaborators. The actors should know locations. Uh, you know, your technical crew should know friends that might know a restaurant that can get you free pizzas, things like that. You really got to keep your eyes wide open on how to bring things in in order to get your film done. Yeah, yeah. So now you you made a joke that you didn't know that much about Sundance, but you were in the playwriting world. You must have known that that was the top tier festival for indies and that it was fairly competitive. Um, I knew it was competitive. I did not know how competitive. Mm -hmm. Um, When my film was submitted, um, they were they looked at over um, 3,200 films, which is pretty hard to believe. Last year, I think it was around 14,000 films. So you know, it's definitely. But I had no idea how many people submitted because I I figured I was making my first movie. God, a lot of people can't do this Uh, on the indie scale. It's like impossible. And again, I go back to this, although this was just 10 years ago, digital was in its infancy. And most film festivals, including Sundance, would not accept a a digital submission. 
Mm. And now almost every film festival, I think every film festival does except uh, digital. So, which makes it great for folks who are making their first film. You know, you want to be the auteur and you want to shoot on film. Okay, but you got to know all the complications uh, that come with it in post. And, uh, you know, and also I think you shouldn't demand on film unless you have like a lot of money backing with it. Not studio, but, you know, a lot of money, someone to back you on that. Sure, sure. And so your submission was just a cold submission that you're none of your act. OK. And um, had your play had some success? Like, was that sort of a credential that you were able to submit with your film? Well, this play has had some success on Broadway or off Broadway. Well, the, yeah, it, had, it had been on off off Broadway. But believe it or not, I, I don't think we used any of that information in the other in the bio. Then it was it's a Samuel French play. It's been done successfully um, in several countries as well as New York. Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, the play that was done in New York, I don't know if anyone watches the Big Bang Theory, but, uh, Kevin Sussman, who plays the, uh, owner of the comic strip of the, of the comic store, he was Ludlow on the play version. Huh. So it's, uh, I, I'm happy to say a lot of people who are in my plays and movies are far more successful than I am. But, uh, <laughs> I, I guess I say, I, I, I give them the golden touch, but, uh, yeah, yeah. So let's dig into your latest film, The Great Gilly Hopkins, um, starring Kathy Bates and Glenn Close. Maybe to start out, you can just give us a log line for the film, and um, I'll, I'll find a trailer and I'll link to that in the show notes. But maybe to start out now, just give us a quick pitch of what the film is about. Well, we all know about uh, Little Orphan Annie, who's sugar and spice and everything nice. Well, this is Little Orphan Annie um, as the Antichrist. Okay. It, it's, it's a foster kid um, who's been bounced around from uh, foster home to foster home. And she's basically decided that she's going to give up on love and hope and be the meanest thing on two feet. Um, she actually takes great pride in crushing people foolish enough to try to get close to her. And uh, the film opens with her coming to her latest um, home to conquer. Um, and uh, the lead character the, who owns the, uh, the house or the, the foster mother uh, is played by Kathy Bates. Um, and Kathy Bates was someone who I had always imagined to play this role. And it took me many, many years in order to get um, to her um, to read the script. And once she read it, she loved it. And she was on board. Um, I'd like to say I just walked up to her agency and did it. But no, I had to hire a casting director um, who will. Agents listen to casting directors. They don't listen to people just knocking on their doors saying this script is perfect um for your a-list star yeah. um i'd like to so let's go. we'll circle back and we'll circle back to those um kind of production details in a minute let's talk a minute about just the adaptation um and you know i get a lot of people coming to me they want to adapt their book or they have a book and they're wondering how to adapt it um so maybe we can talk a little bit about that you have this material and um maybe walk us through that process how do you decide what to leave in how do you decide what to change um what do those decisions look like well first of all uh if you if you're gonna go after a property and I, that's a whole nother story or other section, but we're talking about once you have the property, because those are the questions. There's really two ways to look at um, someone else's work. You're either going to interpret it or adapt it. Um, and you really have to decide that before you, you hit page one. Um, there's a huge difference. Uh, basically, when it comes to already established properties, 99.9% um, .9 of the time, uh, studios interpret it. Now, this is really important to, to remember because every time they actually faithfully adapt it, the, the films have actually turned a profit. Maybe not immediately, but over time they have. Because people who read the book and fans of it or the comic book or whatever will continue to want to take a look at it. If they decide to interpret a property, which means they'll take the one character, and even though it's set in seventh the uh, seventh century England, they're now going to put it on the moon and their best friend is going to be a metal Tyrannosaurus Rex as opposed to a, a love interest. You know, it, it literally bursts into flames. And all you have to do is to go on to um, Box Office Mojo or IMDb and look up um, adaptations, uh, book adaptations, and look how many succeeded and how many failed. 
And the vast majority, no, pretty much all of them that failed are because they thought the idea was good, but they were going to fix it. And a lot of times when you have producers come up to you, especially producers with money, uh, they're going to say, love your screenplay ad adaptation. Now, here's what's wrong with it. And here's how we're going to fix it to make it really, really successful. And of course, if they're offering you a lot of money, that's where you have to decide whether you're going to take the money and not run, but basically be pushed aside. Mm -hmm. um, and so going back to what you want to do, um, it's important to know if you're going to adapt it or interpret it. Because also when you're trying to go after money, especially if you meet someone who loved the book, and then you say, well, here's what I'm going to do with it. They're like, well, that's, that's not the book. What are you, what are you talking about? And, and so you have to know you have to know your whole full spiel story when you're going after someone with money or when you're addressing it as an artist to do it. The first thing you do is make sure you secure the rights. If you take someone's book, completely adapt it, and then think you're going to convince that person to give you the money for it, I mean, the, to give you the rights, I've never heard of that happening. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what I do here is this, uh, an artist puts so much work in, and then they couldn't even reach that person. And, you know, they, they put a good portion of their life into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I'm saying is, if you're going to put a good portion of your life into it, know that you're going to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in fact, some novelists, some people uh, actually take kind of offense at you adapting their material without your permission. without Because, again, it's like you're taking their baby and you're not just changing its clothes, but you may be removing some legs and ear putting in a third eye, you know. So mm -hmm. um, before you take on the world with an adaptation, um, get the rights to it. That's uh, it's my feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So were there some specific things in the book that you just felt wouldn't work in the movie? And maybe we can talk about those changes um, just to get an idea of sort of what your thought process was for not using certain characters or certain scenes or certain in, you know situations. Well, I've adapted actually several um, books, not not just um, my mom's. Uh, the toughest part is we go back to what we're talking about, how many words are in a, a novel or such. A lot that takes place in novels are in characters' heads. And that's really, really tough because no one wants to see a whole movie that, that someone's just saying, well, this is how I feel or this is what I'm thinking about. Um, it works on such a rare occasion, and usually it's used very sparingly. Uh, Blade Runner is a perfect example. Um, but a lot, And then I think there's other ones to refer to, but you never see a movie where it's just going on in the person's head. Um, you have to take those thoughts, those emotions, uh, those hopes, those fears, and transfer them to scenes where they're either interacting with a person or they're doing something that's not telling you what they're doing, but you, you can actually see the fear or hopes or desires or confusion of that character. I really think the I'll just go say it's kind of a lazy um, option for a lot of writers. Just say, I'm really not sure how I can demonstrate how this character is feeling, so I'm just going to have them think about it in their mind. And it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It, let me take that. It rarely works. It rarely works. Um, I've adapted um, several children's uh, books, and again, not just my mother's. And again, you don't want the character just to break that fourth wall, just to tell you because you haven't figured out another way to better demonstrate it. One, uh, in Gilly Hopkins, um, I actually invented a character um, with my mom's permission. Um, so Gilly could interact with that person and tell her some of her thoughts that actually were in the book. And she was just thinking about it in her bedroom. Um, and so I just said, OK, I'm going to create a character that she can bounce her ideas and thoughts off of. So we still get what was in the book, but now for an audience to mm -hmm. to, to enjoy. Um, it is interaction with the audience as well. Um, they want to see your character do things. And uh, the best way to do that is many times to introduce a character or a situation or an environment that you can demonstrate, say, and I'm just throwing this off the thing, but see, you got a tough character that's afraid of spiders. Boom. Right there, that, that scene takes less than, you know, one hundredth of a second almost for to see them flinch. But now you see there's a flaw in that character. And so I think that's a very important thing that you don't 
just carry these mental emotions and have the characters thinking it out, but have scenes or moments where you show those weaknesses or strengths even. Yeah, yeah. So let's just talk just um, about your writing process for a little bit. I'm always just curious to kind of hear just the logistics of, of how writers write. Um, what does your day look like um, just in terms of when you get writing? Do you write for a full, you know, eight or 10 hours? Do you take, try and only write for half a day, maybe do some production stuff on the other half of the day? What does your writing day, once you get into a good groove, look like? Wow. Remember, I think earlier you said, what question don't ask me? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough. Um, as I mentioned, when my kids were younger, I, I really could crank out a lot of writing. Um, and uh, then when they were a little younger going into school, uh, I could do that as well. Um, but uh, as you, I'm, I'm a businessman, you know, in addition to being a writer, I'm also a producer. And uh, so it's not just thinking about writing something new. It's actually working on what I have going. And uh, like Gilly Hopkins, we shot that two years ago. And, uh, but after that, it was still trying to get everything together. Um, our, we had our distributor drop out. So then it was dealing with a new distributor. We had another distributor drop out. So as much as I'd like to say, I'm going to set a whole day here to write, uh, stuff happens and you have to be prepared, um, to not write that day. I try to write at least an hour a day. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, mm -hmm. but as a stay at home dad with two boys, a dog, um, I'm also a volunteer fireman, so my pager goes off usually once a day. Um, then doing the other errands, my wife uh, travels a lot, so I'm in charge of groceries and all this other crazy stuff. So if I can squeeze in an hour a day, I'm happy. And that hour may not necessarily be sitting down, dialogue. It's really, uh, sometimes it's the long run. You know, if, if I know the beginning, the middle, and the end, well, you have to put some stuff in between <laughs> the beginning and the middle and then the middle and the end. So lots of times it's that it's sometimes if I can't come up with writing per se, then I will do an exercise of my characters, write additional backstories for my characters, because sometimes that helps trigger something else down the road, an additional scene. Um, writer's block is a very dangerous thing. Um, and you have to figure out ways to um, sidestep it. Sometimes it'll stop you fully for a day. Uh, I hate to admit it, but sometimes it'll be, I'll go for a week, sometimes two weeks without writing. Um, uh, anyone listening to this, don't do that. But uh, the fact is it can happen. And I guess the most important thing is don't beat yourself up over it. But more importantly, find ways to get around it or end uh, th that block. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the actual practicality of doing an adaptation like this. Do you start out with an outline? Do you open the book and just start writing in final draft? And how much time is spent sort of in the preparation stage? Well, I'm a, I'm a hen and peck um, typer. So I actually I, I write everything longhand. Hmm. And what makes it feel good to me is I'm not racing through my thoughts by writing longhand. It just takes a little bit longer to do it. Um Generally, um, when you're adapting a book, uh, I read it maybe two, three times before I even start to do it again, because although you won't remember every page, you'll remember the storyline. And so uh, each chapter, I will break down to uh, five to ten moments and then say, OK, the, these five or ten moments, obviously you can't have um, – very long five or ten scenes because if you go down through all the chapters, then you're going to have a, I don't know, 400 minute movie. So yeah. um, you really want to take those five or ten moments and figure out how you can encapsulate them either in the scenes that are already in the book or sort of piggyback them on uh, to other scenes. Uh, the great thing about adapting, first of all, you not only have beginning and a middle and end, but you have a lot of the filler as well. Um, the toughest part about adapting novels is is coming in with that uh, hatchet and cutting away things that you just don't have time for. And so uh, the toughest part is when you're being true to it is if you have to lose characters, there has to be a reason for it. Um, and, and if it's just because you want to make a shorter script, that's not always the best thing. You really have to look overall at the storyline 
your protagonist, what they need to get from the beginning of your script to the end of your script. And if they can get there without a certain character, then that character probably can go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're, you're working on the script. You're, you're come up with this first draft or a rough draft. I'm curious to hear a little bit about your, um, just rewriting process. Um, do you have a few trusted people? You send the script out to notes um, and you get notes back. And then how do you go about doing those first um, rewrites on the script? Um, generally, uh, when the it's two different things. When I was doing my mother's work, I would let her read it. I'd let uh, some family members read it. I'd, I'd let um, some of the people that uh, either work for me or my agent read it. Um, Usually, but when I've been approached to do it, they're, they're, they're going to tell me and I, I will get notes. And I've, I've done that where I finish it. I get, I give it back to the producer. They say, love. And you're talking about like a paid writing assignment where they bring you a, a, a book to adapt, you adapt it. And it's a much more formalized process yeah. than, than exactly. writing a spec script. Exactly. But I guess if you're starting out, um, I think it's always dangerous just to give to family and friends because they're going to love it. <laughs> Uh, they're going to be very encouraging, and that's not always the best thing. You need some criticism. Um, and I would say for uh, writers, screenwriters are starting out, I think, and I think you've mentioned this, writing groups can be very, very helpful. Um, I think you can find a writing group, if not in your town, you certainly can find it online. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what I would recommend, though, is people not just jump into a, a writing group. You know, you should, you know, sort of look at it. And, Look who's involved, you know, and 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 see. Uh, the other great thing is it, it's not not a contract, so you can join a writing group and then uh, unjoin a writing group. But what's more importantly is you don't want to waste your time. So I think a little research is involved is, is actually good for when you're looking at writing groups. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know that everyone's opinion is is just that, um, and you're going to get opinions from people who just think your script should go this way, I, they didn't like this. Uh, you may find people that just hate the script overall. Um, but you have to take that um, with both a grain of salt, but if you're getting the same complaints by several people, then you probably should take another look at the script. Mm -hmm. Everybody can't be wrong. That's the one thing I've learned in this business. A lot of people can be wrong, <laughs> and I've met a lot of people that are wrong, but if everyone is saying the same thing, then there's probably an issue with your work that you need to address. Yeah, yeah. So just talk about the um, process. And just when you said you got notes um, from your mother, who in some cases was the original author, it occurs to me that would be a very sensitive situation. And even if the author is not your mother, how do you start that relationship out? If, you, if it's an author maybe you don't know, um, do you sit down with them at the beginning of the process and try and just listen to sort of what some of the themes and ideas that they felt were in the book? And do you go back and get those notes from that person? I can see that being a, um, you know, a very touchy situation getting notes back from the original author. Oh, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, again, we talked about my mom. She's a sweetheart. Um, generally, when I would make changes with her, I would say, look, I'm, I'm thinking about cutting out this character and these are my reasons why. Um, but actually, now that I think about it, that's what I do with other authors when we involve uh, playwrights and authors. Um, when I first do meet them, you know, we talk and uh, and I usually get, say, well, this is kind of what I envision and hopefully it's what they envision because usually it's what they wrote. Mm -hmm. And uh, I and one of the two questions I ask, I say, OK, this is going to be a movie. What do you want this movie to be about and what do you not want this movie to be about? And usually they'll be very direct about that, um, you know, especially writers about novels. They'll tell you exactly what they don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, lots of times the answer of what they want it to be is, well, the book, just put it up there. That, that's what I want. But again, in those initial conversations, you have to be honest with them. You say, well, you do realize if it's one page on a, in a, a screenplay, one page equals about one minute. Your book is 300 pages long. There will not be a 300 minute movie ever. <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to be honest with you. It's just not going to happen. And so they need to understand that. And you say, so, um, I, I believe this character is valuable. I think this character or this, this storyline is, but there's some chapters that may not make it 
to the uh, final final um, script, and that's because it doesn't inherently carry what I call the heart of the book and the, the heart and soul of the book, and that's what you're trying to do. Because in the end, um, film is a different medium from a book, mm-hmm. and you have to understand that. And, and the crazy thing is, even with um, the novelists, and I teach at a lot of schools, and I actually lecture even at grade school level about creativity. And I ask kids who are 10 years old, I said, how many of you in here are movie makers? And maybe one hand will go up. And I'll say, actually, every single one of you is a movie maker. Because when you read a story, you're not looking at words. You're actually creating the whole story in your head. I mean, you've already put a hair color on this person. You've already, when they say they're driving a car, you've already envisioned the type of car. You you create a movie in your head. And so in that same respect, novelists do the exact same thing. They know their characters better than anyone else. And so for someone to try to um, change it can be very difficult for certain novelists. And usually I I know right off the bat talking with them if it's going to be an easy uh, or, or, or difficult. I, I read people fairly well. And that's why um, traditionally and sadly – the way um, Hollywood or producers look at authors is um, they're dangerous and they're troublemakers because they won't want any changes. And uh, so I try to alleviate that. But there have been points where, uh, and we talked about this art by collaboration, there's about 20 people that agree something needs to be changed a certain way, whether it's just for financial reasons or aesthetic or it just doesn't work. And then the author is up against those 20 people going, absolutely not. It's it's wrong. I'm right. You have to understand that. But, of course, when you've reached that level, you've optioned the work. And 99.9% of the time, the author does not have that control. Now, when you're talking about uh, Hunger Games and you're talking about, uh, you know, Twilight series, uh, even Harry Potter, those authors did have a, a lot of clout. But I just mentioned three novelists over a couple hundred thousand over the last hundred years um, who optioned their their work and had no control at all. So that just sort of touches back when I said when you're deciding what to do, whether you're going to interpret it or adapt it, you also have to make the decision if you're going to tell the original author exactly that, that you like their idea, but you're really going to change it. It's a very delicate thing. And almost always that's never discussed until the option ink has dried. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the um, producing of this. So you have the um, script written. Um, maybe just talk about that process of then taking it from script to actually getting production funds and getting this thing into production. I get a lot of people coming to me, to my site. They're asking me, hey, I've got written this script. I want to produce it. How do I go about raising money? How do I go about getting talent attached? Well, I've always said um, you're going to make a movie or – it's your first movie. You're you're always a writer producer until you're not, which means someone's paying you to be either one. Mm-hmm. So I always say yes, I'm a writer and I want a producer credit. And if they go, well, I don't know about the producer credit. You say, well, let's let's work on the contract. Um, because uh, with my first big film, I attached myself as a writer producer because I knew that they were going to fire me as soon as the ink dried because it was a big Hollywood studio. And guess what happened? So the ink they, fired they fired me as a writer, but I was still attached as a producer, so they couldn't get rid of me. And the crazy thing is the way Hollywood works is they brought on two other guys, paid them a ton of money, fired both those guys and brought me back on for no money uh, to fix the script because I was still attached as one of the three writers. Um, so I, I always say try to stay attached as a writer producer. There's also um, two forms of income as well. Mm-hmm. So um, if, if the movie makes – no money as as a as a producing level. Sometimes as the writer, there's also trickle down money when it changes. If you have a good lawyer, if it changes, it goes from not just a theatrical, or if there's no theatrical, if it goes to just ancillary sales, library sales, as you know, like air, airlines and hotels and stuff. There's ways to add money that way. Um, with uh, Gilly Hopkins, I wanted to be it to be my directing debut. So for several years, I was telling everyone, yes, I wrote it. I'm going to direct it. And guess what? No one would give me money. 
they're like, they're like, you've never directed a feature before. I had directed two shorts. So they're like, but this is a completely different thing. And this is even when we had Kathy Bates attached. They're mm-hmm. like, no. Um, I, I met, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40 monetary entities. They're like, no. So I had to come up. I, I sat down with myself over a couple of beers and talked to myself and said, uh, you may, A, lose the lead actress um, and, and just not get this done by being bullheaded and insisting that you're going to write it and direct it. So I stepped back. Um, I was still the writer producer on it because I, but, and we got a director, a great director, and, and he actually had a, he had a great track record. Boom, money started coming in. And people were like, I like that. And then other cast came in and agents also, even with Kathy Bates, they're like still hesitant until this director came on board and like, oh yeah, we'll give it, we'll show it to, you know, uh, we'll show it to Glenn Close and mm-hmm. Glenn Close is in the movie, you know? So it's like, there's choices you have to make and and sacrifices you have to make. So now I'm still searching for my first directorial position. <laughs> but um, the movie proceeded forward to get made because I decided not to be pigheaded and think I could do everything. Mm-hmm. Okay. So these meetings, these meetings with these um, these production companies that potentially could finance this. How did you get those meetings? Was that just from doing other films? You had those connections. How did you actually get those meetings? Well, actually, um, it went back to um, some of the film festivals that I had been in. Uh, I researched um, who had produced some of those because these guys are not, well, you know, they're not top dog producers. You know, they're not Bruckheimer or something like that. These are guys that produce independent films. So I would track down, um, you know, if I was at the Savannah Film Festival, um, and this goes back to my first indie, I would see, okay, this film got a lot of great, either I saw it or got a lot of great press. Um, you can easily track down the producers online and you can usually reach out to their offices. Either they have emails or you can call. And if you have a film under your belt, you can say it. Uh, if you don't, if this script has won some awards or some nods, or if you have a manager, um, on that level, people sometimes, you know, no is a big thing, they say, in Hollywood, but not on the lower level, especially if there's a connection. And even that connection could be as simple as, I was at this film festival, I saw your film, it's terrific, I think my script is very similar or very much in the vein of type of properties that you option and produce. I'd love the opportunity, possibly meet with you, pitch. I think if you get their email, sending a script is crazy. Um, you, you'll never hear from them again. <laughs> um, it's uh, please and thank you. Get get you very far um, in the independent world. You yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a minute about getting um, Kathy Bates. You had mentioned earlier in the interview that you got um, a casting director on board, and she got that. And we don't have to talk about the specifics exactly of what that entails. And and I mean, we can all go on IMDb Pro and we can track down casting directors. But sure. just in general, what does a high level casting director expect financially to get involved with a project like that? And you can just give us like a ballpark figure. Um, I've had friends that have done sort of on a lower level, you know, two, three, four, five thousand dollars, ten thousand um, dollars, usually somewhere in that ballpark. But what would what would you if someone came to you and asked, well, how much am I going to have to spend on a casting director who can get to these these types of, of people? Um, what would you kind of tell them? Well, actually, there's there's a couple different ways to approach it. Um, casting directors, they don't do it for free. <laughs> that, that, that's their bread and butter. Um, but casting directors, depending on the level of casting director, it, it could be it, it could vary widely. Um, some charge fifteen hundred. Um, some charge ten grand. You know, um, usually though, it's not. Up front, it's usually a certain amount up front, but there's wiggle room also with the casting directors. Well, would you also be willing to come on as a producer? A lot of direct casting directors now come on as producers because that credit will help them down the road, depending on what else they're doing. But also, producers also can participate in back end. Now, we all know there's no back end, <laughs> there's never back end. However, it is a mental note or benefit to people that you're talking to. It gives them more confidence in their importance in a project. So the casting director, well, I'm not just casting director. I'm a producer. I'm going to be getting some back end here. And uh, 
and just mentally, even though everyone goes, oh, we know there's no back end, it shows that um, the uh, producer has even more commitment to that casting director. There's a, a um, connection, a, a, a promise to work harder together since he's not just, he or she is not just casting your film, they're a partner, they're a producer. And yeah, you were going to say something? Um, I'm just going to say you had mentioned that you, from the very early on, you, um, you, you felt like Kathy Bates was a good fit for this particular role. Did you then go on IMDb Pro and start looking at movies Kathy Bates has been on and then looking at casting directors that had worked on those movies so that you knew your casting director could get to her? Um, was there anything that clear or how did you choose your casting director? Well, I brought, well um, I brought the casting director on very early on. Um, and uh, as it happens many times in the business, an additional casting director was brought on on top of that casting director. Um, and that does happen sometimes, especially uh, when more money comes in and uh, more cast um, ob- goals of the casting director may not be reachable by that casting director, but by bringing someone else in uh, higher up. Um, I'll be honest, it was not the most comfortable situation for me. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, committed to anyone. And it was one of those situations where uh, once we were further along, again, my, my, my power had been uh, subdued and people with money coming in above me had become more powerful. So no matter what I said, uh, it was going to go one way or the other. Um, so, uh, in that respect, once this other casting director came in, that person had like super, super clout. They were also super, super expensive, but again, the money came in, uh, to do that. The fact is though, there's a lot of lower range casting directors that are not overly expensive, but if you look at their body of work, um, it's very impressive. And so agents will take note of that. So it may be a casting person that you're not 100% familiar with, but agents are. And agents know casting directors are great um, interpreters of screenplays, meaning they know it's going to go. They know it has a lot of potential. And so casting directors overall work a lot harder than you think uh, when they're trying to get um, actors to look at it. It's not just like, hey, will you look at this? They spend time to talk to the agent to say, this is why I think your actor should do this. This is why this actor who usually commands a huge salary should do uh, this independent film because of blah, 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 blah. So um, if they're if you're putting your movie together and obviously there's a little more difficult if you're in the middle of America. But if you're in any major city or near any major city, there are casting directors there and you Go ahead, check them out, look at their work. If there's specific actors that you see that are in their work, then you already have an in to a certain degree. They've worked together. Um, it's research, 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 really. Yeah, yeah. So let's then talk about um, once you got this film done. I'm curious. You said at one point you lost a distributor. You had to go out and find a new distributor. One of the things, and in my own search um, in talking with distributors and producers, one of the things that always comes up is you know family friendly films are something that um, still you can sell a lot of DVDs. There's still a good play internationally. Mark, there's good international play, and um, having you know some stars like a Kathy Bates or a Glenn Close in the film. So to me, like on paper or at least this looks like the perfect film. I mean, you especially coming from a successful book, you know, you've got a pedigree that way. You've got great actors in it and um, it's family friendly. Um, So it just, it's, it's surprising to me that you then had trouble with the distributor because everything that I talk to, everyone is saying, you know, this would be the perfect type of project. When people describe projects, um, this, this, this comes up like just looking at this on paper, it strikes me as an incredibly good sound financial investment for, for people. Well, absolutely. Um, and the, as much as a film can be, let's say. <laughs> yeah. Well, the issue is um, both the distributors, they didn't like drop the project. They actually went away. They collapsed. They, oh, I see. They stopped. I see. And, and not to mention names, but actually, if you do a little research, you'll see the ones that were attached. that are no longer attached to it. And, and these were big dogs. Um, the problem with that, though, is. And you're saying they just flat out went out of business. Yes. Yes. So. And, and so the problem is 
I, and I'm trying to put a nice way to put this. You don't want to get an indie stink to your film. And what that means is if it's if it was made a while ago and time keeps going by and no one's distributing it, other distributors will look at it and go, well, there must be something wrong with it, even if there's nothing <laughs> wrong with it at all. And actually, that's what happened with, with Gilly was we were with one distributor for almost a year. And then we went with another distributor for almost a year. And we're like, why aren't we releasing? Why? And it was because they were having internal problems. And then, boom, we're two years out. And other distributors go, well, clearly there's something wrong with it <laughs> if it hadn't been distributed yet. And, and, that, and that's the problem, really. It's, it's convincing people who act, actually haven't even looked at the movie. It's just uh, um, that, that there's something wrong with it. And so uh, if you're looking for distribution, what I do say is never give up. But do realize that there is time limitations um, and expiration times for something on certain levels. Um, you really don't see many movies get wide theatrical release or even limited theatrical release that has been sitting on a, on a shelf for a couple years. It's just, it's, you don't see it happen. Now, if you self-distribute, yeah, I guess you could sit on it for 20 years if you want. But if you're talking about the marketability of your property, especially if it got great nods at film festivals, you don't want to say, oh, well, this was great at a film festival two and a half, three, four years ago. Um, so basically with selling your screenplay or selling your movie, it is a deal with the devil. Um, you have to figure out what's the best for you, what's the best for the script, what's the best for the movie. Um, and, but there's always a amount of unknown to it. Like I said, I've been doing it for 10 years. I had a movie that I released with Disney. Uh, but now I'm releasing a film with a much, much smaller company. It's a Lionsgate premiere. It's Lionsgate, but it's Lionsgate premiere, which is a different branch of Lionsgate, which means they look at things differently than say Lionsgate would. Uh -huh. And so you're always learning new things. Um, uh, and, and learning new ways to hear yes and new ways to hear no. Um, and the occasional maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So just let's have one more quick conversation on, um, Finding material and optioning it from from an author. You had mentioned earlier on never proceed um, on a project if you don't have the material. Maybe you can talk about that process a little bit. Um, I get a lot of screenwriters coming to me, and they basically say exactly that. Say, listen, I read this book a couple years ago, and I want to approach the author. Maybe you just have some tips. Um, my first thing, obviously, there's legal issues where you have to make sure that that contract is buttoned up. But maybe just on the front end of that, like what do those conversations look like? Um, do you try and approach the agent? Nowadays, so many writers are available, whether it be on Facebook or Twitter. It's usually not that hard to like approach the writer directly, but sometimes they have an agent. Should you go through their agent? Um, just anything, any tips you have on that? I think would be, be very helpful. Uh, I basically feel any way you can do it is best. But th as you mentioned, the, the real problem nowadays is, as we know, the word IP, um, you know, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. um, many books that are coming out have already been optioned before they've even um, been seen by anyone. Publishers will reach out to studios and say, by the way, great book. We're going to be releasing it on a million copies. We know it's going to be huge. Boom. It's gone before you even heard it. It's gone, be gone before it's even been printed. But as you mentioned, if there's books that were out a couple of years ago, um, some of the easiest ways, lots of times on the back of the book covers, it says Martha lives with her husband in Battle Creek, Michigan. You might be able to go online and track down that address one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, you might be able to find out their personal email because it, they may not be as huge as you think. Um, publishers, going to the publishers is always good too, especially if it's an older book, saying, very interested in this. Um, could you please um, put me in touch with the writer? Sometimes they say yes. Sometimes they say no. Um, but always got to try as many no's as possible mm -hmm. is basically the way of it. Um, lots of times, if they've done several books... The, the, I, and I know someone who did this before, contact them about a lesser known book. And so that might pique both the agents, publishers and authors interest. And so when you get to them, it's not really a lie. You say, I really, really enjoyed so-and-so, but you know what? 
what I really think, after reviewing all of your materials, this book would be even more, uh, I would like to do this one even more than the one I told you. Is it, tri- is it a trick? Yeah, I guess so. It, bait and switch. I think in sales, that's called bait and switch. <laughs> bait and switch. Um, but uh, it is, it's not a bait and switch in respects to, you still want their material. Uh, you yeah. still think their material is great. And um, I just think it's, it's a way, getting in that door is very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I had a friend, and um, I think it was an one other thing I wanted to say. Sure. Lots of times these authors do um, book signings and stuff, and if you can track down where they're doing a book signing, don't harass them. Just say I'm a screenwriter. I'm very interested in your property. May I get in touch with your publisher? And just by them saying yes, you can say I met so and so the other day. I told him I was very interested in this property. Um, so um, they told me to contact you. And I guess I can get an email from you to reach them. And when you put them on that spot, they're a, usually not going to call you a liar. Um, they may follow up with the author first. But if that conversation happened, lots of times they're like, well, geez, I guess if the author said that she'd be willing to – he or she would be willing to chat, then, then we'll put them together. I mean the great thing nowadays is there is email where it's not – it's personable enough that people can say thank you, but no thank you. You know, giving someone a phone number is still to this day very dicey. Yeah, yeah. So what are those first conversations like when you start to meet the um, author? And let's assume, too, that that a lot of the listeners of this podcast are probably not, you know, produced writers, or if they do have a couple of credits, they're certainly not, um, you know, A-list screenwriters. So what do those first conversations with the author look like, and how do you convince them to that you're the right writer and potentially option this material to you for not a lot of money or maybe even no money? Well, first of all, research, research, research. Don't call them because you read their book 10 years ago. You better have read that book within the last 24 hours, because believe it or not, authors know their, they know their work like the back of their hand. So if you really want to talk to them about a specific property, know, know the property and be able to be passionate about that property and be passionate about, be passionate how you want to tell their story, but just in a movie. And lots of times authors will be willing to give you a, a six-month free option. Now, is that a lot of time to write a screenplay? No, but guess what? You're getting a free option. So, you know, that that gives you a reason to write. I mean, the best reason, obviously, for writing is deadlines. And this way you have a deadline. And like I said, you may not have written the script yet, but you should have done some research. You should have thought about how you're going to be fleshing it out because you're going to be talking to the author. Mm-hmm. The, the most valuable thing you have when you don't have money is your words. And that that doesn't count just for writing but talking to people. I know a lot of um, screenwriters hate talking to people, but you got to be able to talk to people in order to convince them to take a look at your stuff. And you can say you can do that through emails, yes, but there'll probably become a time where you got to talk to people. And ums and uhs and buts and, well, you know, like this and like that, that's not going to help you when you're having conversations with people. So you have to be able to know exactly what you want. And in respects, as we discussed earlier, what they want. You want, you know what they want. They want you to do a good job. They want you to do an honest interpretation, um, a honest adaptation of their work. Um, we discussed earlier, if you're going to say, well, actually, I like this part. But I didn't like this part, so I'm not going to put it in. No, you're going down a, a rabbit's hole there, and you may chase that person away. Um, so if you do want to change it, you have to realize uh, it's not bait and switch. <laughs> it's not yeah. bait and switch. Might be better to mention that after you have the option. <laughs> better to tell them after the option because in the end, uh, whether they like it or not, it is a different medium and things will change. If you're planning to change it more, maybe you keep that closer to your vest. Mm-hmm. But actually, if you don't do that well, they're going to they're gonna sniff it right off the bat. If, if you don't know how to talk to them, they're going to say, oh, I see. This person – likes a little bit of my book, but they're really going to just do something crazy to it. And so I'm just going to say no right here. It's easy to say no right here. Um, So practice, practice, practice your pitch to authors just as much as you practice pitches to uh, producers and studios and, and other folks. 
Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about um, how people can see the great Geely Hopkins. Um, do you know the release schedule, when it's going to be out, where it's going to be available? Yes, it's being released on October 7th. Um, they're doing the 15 major theatrical markets. Okay. So New York, L.A., Washington, D.C., uh, Boston, um, Dallas, Houston, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. top markets. But uh, the other place, it's uh, on demand. And okay. it's going to be available in close to 100 million homes. So um, if I can get uh, a million people to do it, it would be great. (laughs) No kidding. So perfect, perfect. And I always like to end the interviews just by asking the guests how people can follow along with you. Um, If you're on Twitter, Facebook, blog, website, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, and I'll I'll link it all up in the show notes. Yeah, um, I'm on on Facebook. Um, I'm I'm a bit of a dinosaur, so I'm not on Twitter yet. Um, I have my own website um, called dpplays.com, which is davidpattersonplays.com. And um, that that's pretty much how I'm up and about right now. Okay. Um, perfect, I, perfect. Yeah. So, well, David, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me today. Um, excellent interview. Well, thank you. I, and I hope I've given some people some thoughts and hopes and stuff. And uh, obviously, have. everyone has to go see my movie. But uh, <laughs> if I can leave you guys with one thing, and I, I, I'm very serious about this. Uh, it is a very tough business. Uh, people tend to be very hard on themselves. So if you're going to make a life, uh, make art a part of your life. Um, don't make your life all about your art, because if your life is all about your art, you can go to bed hungry and wake up angry for the rest of your life. So just yeah, yeah. just realize that life, uh, your life is not about making movies. It's only movies is a part of your life. So sound advice. I, I completely agree. So excellent advice. So thank you again, David. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. All right. Take care. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the one who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The reader will evaluate your script on six key factors. Concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were submitted to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your projects, Projects, this is a great way to do it. We will also write a log line and synopsis for you. You can add this service to the analysis or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your script gets a recommend from a reader, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast service I use myself to promote my own scripts and it's the same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking for material. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. In the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Craig Van Sickle. He is a television writer and producer, and one of his many creations was the hit TV show, The Pretender, which ran in the late 90s. He's got a ton of great stories and a lot of great advice for people who are looking to write for television. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.